Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this EU Cross Globe webinar in cooperation with the America Europe Fund at KU Leuven. Today, we will be talking about a new book entitled Power on the Precipice The Six Choices America Faces in a Turbulent World, published with Yale University Press with the author Dr. Andrew Imbri and Franz Baron Bandau. Andrew Imbri, from 2013 to 2017, served as a member of the policy planning staff and was speechwriter to Secretary Kerry at the US Department of State. He is currently senior fellow at the Center for Security and Emerging Technology at Georgetown University, where he focuses on issues at the intersection of artificial intelligence and international security. Ambassador Franz van Dahl, over his 45 year long diplomatic career, has held many prominent positions, including permanent representative of Belgium to NATO and the EU, and Belgian ambassador to the United States, as well as chef of cabinet of both the president of the European Council, Herman van Rompuy, and King Philip of Belgium. In 2017, he was appointed Belgian Minister of State. So thank you both for joining us today. Uh, as we once again look to the United States, where, as you know, a fraud presidential election process, process is set to define the course of American foreign policy for years to come. But rather than arguing, as many do, that the United States is either destined for continued dominance or doomed for irreversible decline, Andrew Imbri suggests instead that the United States must adapt to changing global dynamics and compete more wisely. So we will start our conversation with an introduction by the author, which will be followed by comments from Ambassador Vendel. In the latter part of this webinar, we will also take questions from the audience. So please send your questions to me via the webinar chat box. We very much look forward to hearing from you. Now it's my pleasure to give the floor to Dr. Andrew Imbri. You have the floor. Terrific. Well, thank you so much, uh, Alex. It's wonderful to be here with you and with the ambassador. Uh, and it's, it's a very special treat to be with the Center for Global Governance Studies and the wider University of Lumen community and all of you tuning in from around the world. I spent a number of happy years uh, in Belgium uh, as the son of a foreign service officer. And it was, it was a wonderful posting for my family. And we would often go to Leuven and, and visit the, the, the city, the library, uh, and marvel at the rich history. So it's really, it's a treat. So my, my book actually in many ways is a book about the, the connections that America has with Europe and with its allies around the world. And it's a book, as you said, about how we think about American leadership uh, in a new world but also it's a book about history and how we can apply the choices uh, and constraints and stakes that we've learned from the past to navigating the turbulent present. And what I'd like to do is just share an overview uh, of what the book tries to do and then zero in on one choice in particular that I think will have special relevance for this audience. So the book in many ways lays out six big choices for America today. And with each choice, I tell the story of a leader who has wrestled with the tough trade-offs of that choice. And then I look to history to ask what we can do uh, moving forward to adapt more wisely. So let me just, the, the six choices uh, are as follows. The first is core or periphery. This is really a choice about where, when, and how a country deploys military force, uh, where it should intervene in the world and how. And for that, I look to, to history, I look to the Soviet Union's intervention in Afghanistan, uh, and I talk to a young soldier, a young American soldier who served uh, as part of the US intervention uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, and I, I try to ask him how he sees this, this conflict and how he wrestles with the trade-offs. The second choice is about butter or guns. This is a choice about how a nation invests. Where should it channel its, its funds? Should it invest more? in building up the sources of its economic well-being, infrastructure, education, uh, science and technology, or should it invest more in modern military hardware and software and in new military personnel and platforms? Uh, and again, as for every choice, this isn't really an either or decision. It's about setting the right balance between them. It's about calibration. 
And so for every choice, there are tough trade-offs, uh, but there's also tough decisions to be made. The next choice is allies or autonomy. And this question really gets to the heart of America's uh, role in the world. Should it try to conserve resources and maximize its flex flexibility by cutting its allies loose and pursuing a more unilateral or bilateral approach to foreign relations? Or should it cement its alliances and partnerships in the world, uh, re-engage multilaterally, and try to link arms with allies and partners in Europe and Asia and elsewhere in the world uh, to try to lead with purpose? Uh, and for this chapter, I look to history, I look to the Habsburgs Empire's uh, alliance strategies uh, in, the, in the 18th century. And I interview uh, a renowned American diplomat who I'll say a little bit more about in a moment. The next choice is power or persuasion. So persuasion and coercion are two big choices for a country when they try to manage the rise of other powers in the world. And there are these two approaches you can take. Do you lean on diplomacy, commercial engagement, and legal strategies to try to manage uh, other rising powers in the world and integrate them into a shared set of rules, norms, and institutions? Or do you pursue a more coercive approach? Uh, and historically, we've seen both, and there are lessons that can be learned. One of the cases that I look at for this is how Britain managed the rise of the United States uh, in the 19th century and the early 20th century. And I talked to another American negotiator uh, who has wrestled with difficult choices around dealing with rising regional competitors. Uh, the next choice is people power or pinstripe rule. This is really a, a, an interesting uh, question for, for America, but for many great powers, which is how do you deal with the question of corruption? How do you make sure that you have good governance and accountability? And what can we do today when we're seeing strategic networks of corruption? So it's not just the challenge of wrestling with corruption at home, but how do these corrupt networks infiltrate governance from abroad uh, and can erode the foundation and the institutional credibility that you need to convert your resources into lasting influence. Uh, so that's, a, that's an important choice. And for that, I look back to history to the Ottoman Empire to see what we can learn about our institutions uh, for great powers and how important it is to have good governance and adapt effectively. And I interview a scholar and anti-corruption activist who has uh, dealt with this challenge all over the world. The final choice is open or closed. I think this is a, a big challenge for uh, many nations today, which is how do you navigate an increasingly fast-paced, digitized world uh, that is also economically and environmentally sustainable and brings along its citizens. It doesn't leave people behind. And that touches on a whole range of issues with trade and investment, but also how do you build a foreign policy that's sustainable for the middle class? Uh, and that's a really big challenge for America right now. And for that, I tell uh, Secretary John Kerry's story and share his insights. And I also look back to history uh, at a time when uh, America was wrestling with competing visions of order. Now, before I wrap up, let me just share one personal story from the book about this choice of allies or autonomy, because I really think it, do, it cuts to the heart of a major challenge that America faces today. And the story I'd like to share is from uh, an American ambassador, <clears throat> one of our renowned ambassadors, and that's Ambassador Nicholas Burns, who was our permanent representative to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, to NATO. And I interviewed him and tried to share his story in the book because I think it conveys uh, important stakes for America today in a turbulent world. So on 9-11, uh, Nicholas Burns had been, uh, just for a brief period, the ambassador to NATO. And he put in a call back to uh, our national security advisor at the time. Uh, and he asked her that he said, the NATO allies want to invoke its mutual defense clause, Article 5, for the first time. And I need the president's permission. And this really was a call that Nick Burns was born to make. He grew up in Boston, in the city of Boston, to greatest generation parents uh, who had gone through the Great Depression and World War II. And he knew that sometimes War was necessary, as in World War II. But he also knew ultimately that war represented a failure of diplomacy. Uh, and he, he saw that sort of firsthand when he was 17 at the Vietnam War uh, was coming to a close. Uh, President Nixon had negotiated a uh, peace agreement in 1973, but peace seemed more elusive than ever. And the Vietnam War was obviously a, a tragic conflict and it was very divisive in America. 
Uh, and, and for Nick Burns, this were really burrowed into his communities. It really was part of the dinner, dinner table conversations with his families. And he became very interested in how do you make sure that we have effective diplomacy to avoid things like this. But he also had a, a really uh, important realization, which is that America's broad network of allies and partners, its friends in the world, were a great advantage for the country and such an important factor in protecting and safeguarding democratic values in the world. And so fast forward to 9-11, to uh, and this was obviously uh, just a terrible tragedy for our country. When the first plane hit, uh, hit the tower, uh, Nick and his colleagues thought that it might have been a, a ter just probably a terrible accident. But then when the second plane hit, they knew uh, that this was an act of terror and they had to figure out uh, what to do. And many of the uh, buildings in, the, in DC, the State Department, the, the Pentagon, the White House have been evacuated. And so NATO as a decision-making body was trying to figure out what to do. And one of Ambassador Burns's colleagues, David Wright, the Canadian ambassador to NATO, suggested invoking Article 5, the Mutual Defense Clause, as a sign of solidarity with America. And so they went to work and Ambassador Burns briefed the North Atlantic Council uh, that was th then chaired by Lord Robertson. And he said that this really could be uh, uh, the deadliest day for America since the Battle of Antietam, which was uh, the deadliest one-day battle in the American Civil War. And he knew that to a person, our allies were committed. And on September 12th, when Americans woke up the next morning after this, this awful tragedy, they got to see the message that our allies were there with us at this moment of real trial and tribulation and turbulence. And so it was, it was a moving moment, especially because the assumption was always that if we were ever to invoke Article 5, it would be for the Americans to come back to Europe uh, to try to help our European partners. But in this case, uh, Europeans rose up to, to, defend with Amer to defend America and to stand in solidarity with us. And a few days uh, later, Ambassador Burns was with his wife and they went to Leuven uh, and they went to the, the town hall and they started to see a long line of people there. And he's trying to figure out what it was. And as he inched closer, uh, he realized that this was a long line of people there to sign a condolence book and to lay flowers uh, and to be in solidarity with America. Uh, and this meant a great deal. And Nick told me that outpouring of emotion, uh, that's really what an alliance means. Uh, and it was especially significant given the history, you know, given that, uh, you know, what, ha what Levin had seen in World War I and II and what happened to the library, uh, the destruction of all these incredible books and artifacts from the past. And so there was a rich sense of history, but also a sense of the tragedy of history as well. Uh, and so this moment was, was really important. And for me, I think it crystallizes a couple lessons that I'll just share to close out about America's alliances in the world today. The first is that as someone who's worked in the State Department, I saw firsthand how important our allies were. They are assets, not liabilities. And I think too often we put our alliances on the cost side of the letter, ledger. We tally up how much we're uh, giving to other countries, but we also have to recognize uh, the extraordinary benefits to all of us who want to protect our, our democratic values and how important these alliances are for meeting challenges in the world that no country can solve on its own, from pandemics and climate change to security challenges uh, in, in different parts of the world. And so it's really important to engage multilaterally and to recognize how important these friendships are. The second lesson I'd share is that our alliances have to adapt if they're going to be successful for a new world. Uh, that means that they need to think about modernized capabilities for the world and how those capabilities are compatible with one another, how, they, how they're interoperable. We also need to think about how we deal with new challenges, whether that is uh, with pandemics and pandemic preparedness and emergency response, whether that's cyber and infrastructure protections or the challenge of a rising China. Uh, and I do think that that's, a, that's hopefully something we can talk about today. Uh, but those are all really important for our alliances to adapt to a new era where many of the challenges we're facing are not direct military to military conflict, but actually happen beneath the threshold of military conflict, whether that's information operations, economic coercion, energy coercion. We need to be able to think clearly and effectively about how to adapt our alliances and how to have multinational force planning and development so that we're effectively assigning roles and responsibilities. The, the, the final lesson I just share is that I think democracies really need to stick together. We need to have more resilience at home. Uh, and I think COVID-19 has really shown that, 
but we also need more solidarity with liberal democracies in the world. Uh, and I do think that our allies and partners are, 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 are there for, uh, for us. And I think the strength of our democracies at home is tied and linked to our ability to be a force for progress in the world. And democracies are strongest when they stick together. And so I think that that also entails being creative about where our alliances and friendships are in the world, linking arms with Europe, but also with partners in the Asia Pacific and elsewhere. Uh, and so I think we have a big agenda. Uh, there's a lot at stake in the world right now, and America does have fateful choices to make. But I'll just share uh, one, one insight from, from America's past that I think has relevance for today, which is that uh, one of our great presidents, uh, President Franklin Roosevelt, said in his fourth inaugural address, he quoted the writer Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, who said, "The only way to have a friend in a world, and the, the only way to have a friend is to be one." And I think that we really have to ask ourselves, you know, after 9/11, America counted many friends uh, among its European partners, uh, and can we say the same thing today? And I think it's important uh, that we recognize that our strength uh, as a democracy uh, is really about the, the power of our example, not just the example of our power. And we do need to find ways to revitalize and reimagine our alliances and partners for a new era. So I'm really excited to talk about, about these themes with the ambassador who has been such an engaged uh, and effective advocate uh, on behalf of his country uh, and such a committed diplomat to the United States uh, when he served there. Uh, and I'm really excited to be in conversation with all of you tuning in. So I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, for this for this great great introduction that really kind of brings into focus the big big questions we're we're facing in some ways also on both sides of the Atlantic in I think in many of the foreign policy debates in the European Union uh, we're very much talking about how do we you know harness once again alliances um, put to the full democratic liberal values and develop the capabilities to adapt to new to new challenges of course uh, it's now my great pleasure of course to give the floor to uh, Franz van Dahl for his comment. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, um, this uh, looks like a, a book worthwhile reading because you go beyond appearances of the day you try to go to the fundamentals Andrew and I think a lot is to be said for uh, for that approach it doesn't increase the number of your readers but it will probably increase the depth of what the readers who read it are reading uh, i have three uh, three footnotes to uh, which i would like to make and which i would like you to react to if there is time first of all you mentioned the habsburg empire which uh, worked well economically, which had its own internal balances, although they had a severe problem with the Hungarian part of the empire, but they kept it together. Uh, and I'm still wondering whether we are still paying a price for the way it disappeared. Um, and my point is, uh, is about the United States, a pluribus unum, a very big ensemble, which gives strength, unity uh, gives uh, strength, but I have the feeling that what it keeps the country together um, being its institutions, because your country had only very late in the day a fixed territory and has never had a kind of a fixed population composition. To what extent uh, um, are the American institutions under stress and under strain at the time of speaking? That's my first remark and question. My, my second one is uh, about populism uh, and both we here in Europe and you in the United States, you are confronted with this phenomenon of uh, populism. Um, do you have any feeling to which extent it is becoming something permanent 
something durable or whether it's one of these things which come and go if you see on the european side uh, how spectacularly the Freiheitspartei in Austria lost the Vienna elections, how the altern alternative for Deutschland is falling apart in a couple of uh, lenders, then you think, well, these things, they come and they go and they end up fighting among themselves. But I would like to for you to go into the question of the durability of, let's say, populism, for want of a better term, in the United States. And the third one, the third point is about alliances. Uh, it's absolutely true what you said about Article 5 and Nick Burns. Uh, in the end, if push comes to shove and the United States needs allies, they always come from the same place, which is Europe. And <clears throat> then you say, well, if these things happen, if we help each other out, why do we have to develop such a fractious um, relation where we seem to talk uh, um, not to each other uh, very much? And my question then uh, becomes, is there um, any margin for to put an end at what has been a very uh, divisive discussion on burden sharing in NATO. Uh, we have always resisted being confronted just by a comparison of military expenditure, saying, well, we enlarged the European Union to Central Europe, which was a huge contribution to European stability, which in a way allowed President Obama to pivot to Asia because the problems were there. That for once, they were not in Europe. So this this thing of um, of burden sharing, can we get rid of it? Because burden sharing is much more is about much more than only about uh, military expenditure. And uh, an attendant question is the following: uh, <clears throat> How widespread or not widespread is the feeling in uh, in the United States that the United States alone? Uh, can uh, is not capable of reaching enough critical mass to determine the the way things evolve around the planet. Is there a, a kind of reasoning which says we need allies, uh, in the sense that yes, we have allies. That's a thing of the past. That's uh, we have inherited from the past. No, and the conviction that without allies, uh, the even the biggest country on. Uh, on the planet doesn't have enough weight to influence what has to be influenced. And then I'm thinking, of course, about the, the, the uh, rivalry uh, with, uh, with China, for instance. Those are my three remarks and three attendant questions. Well, those are fascinating. Let me try to address each in turn. So the first question about our institutions, I think is so important because one of the things that I try to do in the book is present a conceptualization of power and influence. And one of the things that I think is often overlooked is that a nation can have a lot of resources. It can have many things, but the, but the challenge is how do you convert those resources into lasting influence? And our institutions are the way that we do that. You know, so it's it's not enough to just look at see who who which nation has what and who has more of what. We have to ask, you know, is the integrity of our institutions are they are they sound? Are they free from partisanship and polarization? Are they able to look into the future and practice smart strategic foresight? Uh, and my my concern is that right now in America, you know, obviously the levels of polarization are high. Uh, and that presents a real challenge for long-term strategic thinking and for our ability to take what I still think is a good hand. You know, America has many advantages. It's a large, diverse, innovative, dynamic, uh, and powerful country with, with very strong uh, research universities and colleges. But we have to be able to work together effectively on a bipartisan basis to act with purpose in the world. And one of the things that we're seeing is when you're very polarized at home, it's hard to reach agreement uh, across the aisle 
which means that you see wild swings in policy from one administration to the next. When you have polarized institutions, it's hard to not only make promises, but to keep them. It's hard to draw consistent lessons learned from our recent foreign policy successes and failures. And it makes it difficult to have a serious, sober, and clear-eyed public debate about the challenges we face. One of the reasons I wrote this book is because I do think sometimes there's a lack of clarity uh, around election time, but just in general, given how polarized we are, about America's power and place in the world. And we need to have that broad basis of public support to have a sustainable foreign policy. So from to, to by my lights, I think our, our institutions really matter and making sure that we're attending to the underlying sources of polarization to try to deal with them is important. Uh, that means we need to deal with some of the social and economic disparities that underlie this polarization. It means we need to renew our civic strength. It means we need to think creatively about ideas uh, on how to sort of de depolarize uh, some of these critical questions. There's some really interesting ideas out there on reform for how we can do that. I'd be happy to go into that uh, later, uh, but, but there's some solutions on the table, but it's gonna be hard and it will require the political will to move forward uh, together as a country. And that's again, one of, the, one of the reasons why out of a sense of urgency, I, I wrote this book. Uh, the next point uh, that you raise on populism, I think is really critical. Uh, you know, Secretary Kerry once wrote that uh, nostalgia won't defeat populism, only progress will. And I think one of the challenges is that many of the drivers of, of populism are, are still with us. Uh, inequality, uh, rapid, rapid changes in technology, uh, financial crises, uh, economic, sort of broad-based economic instability, but also a sense that the democratic project is being discredited or declining. I mean, we've already seen uh, in the first uh, 15 years or so of this century, according to one prominent democracy scholar, a 17 uh, democracies failed. According to the Economic Intelligence Unit, uh, a few years ago, uh, democracy receded in 89 countries and only advanced in 27. Uh, there's a whole host of measures to suggest that we may be facing a democratic recession of sorts. Uh, and that, that democratic project matters because people need to feel that they are represented in the political process uh, and they need to feel a sense of purpose when they engage. And so my sense is that, uh, that this is a problem that always lurks. It's always an issue that democracies have to deal with uh, because uh, democracies are about free and open societies with broad-based political participation. And when people feel like their interests are not represented, uh, they pursue other means. And so I think it's really important that we ha have a democratic renewal project where we create unifying narratives, where we, we lay out the facts clearly and try to make sure we have a coherent information environment, but also that we speak to people's underlying concerns, uh, whether that's deepening inequality, whether that's a sense that the system is unfair or that the governance isn't what it should be. Uh, and I do think we really have our work cut out to show that inclusive, multi-ethnic democracies can really work and deliver for their people. Uh, and that that's the challenge. And I feel like that's a challenge that we can meet, uh, Americans, Europeans, and allies around the world. But it's we're not, we're not there yet, and we have to make sure that we're staying focused on this problem. On the question of burden sharing, uh, my sense is that you know, this has long been a source of tension uh, in the alliance uh, with between America and Europe. We've seen these debates go back many, many decades. Uh, but it's, it's always there. I think there's, it's important for allies to do their part, but we have to broaden the debate and think beyond just questions around 2%. We have to think about a holistic view of security, a comprehensive view of security, and how our allies and partners can help meet that, thinking clearly about roles and responsibilities, about multinational force planning and development, thinking beyond uh, you know, just, just uh, one form, uh, one criteria, and thinking more effectively about how we operate together in the world to meet a whole host of new challenges, whether that is pandemic preparedness and response or climate change. Uh, and so I think really my sense is that the debate has to be broader than just 2%, even though it's important that allies step up on security and defense, because we are in a world where democracies have to defend themselves, they have to shore up the credibility of deterrence, and that's just a foundation. But then we have to build from there and, and broaden our horizons and think about how we can be smart and effective. That means 
How do we have modernized and advanced capabilities for the challenges that we face? How do we think about uh, more networked alliances, more federated structures? How do we think about roles and responsibilities? And how do we link arms with democracies in Europe and Asia? More and more European countries are looking to the Indo-Pacific, are developing strategies around what's happening in the Indo-Pacific. I think we can be creative about that challenge as well. I mean, I just say this, I think this is not a, a time for simply restoring an old model. It's, it's a time for reinvention and reimagining what our alliances can do in the world to meet a whole host of new challenges. I mean, one, for example, on, on pandemics is that we could be having conversations right now about stockpiling medical supplies and thinking creatively about how we will respond to the next pandemic that will inevitably happen if we if we don't uh, really plan effectively. Uh, and so this is this is to me a holistic challenge for democracies to really wrestle with. And that's that's the important message that that I'd leave. Uh, you know, the the last point I just I just share about about Ch about China and the broader transatlantic relationship. You know, I think that we uh, have seen, uh, you know, disagreements and tensions in the transatlantic relationship before from uh, the German rearmament debates in the Cold War, the Suez crisis, uh, to, to challenges uh, at, with NATO and, and de Gaulle, uh, to uh, the 1980s debates over missiles, to, uh, to, to Kosovo, to Iraq. And we've, we've seen these debates before. Uh, but what I do think is, is challenging right now is that uh, that you know, we have a deficit of trust that we need to repair and rebuild, and we need to return to our foundation, which is our shared values. I think you know, no two regions in the world share more in common uh, about in terms of our core democratic values than the United States and Europe. And we need to think through a modernized agenda for the transatlantic relationship that keeps us pointed forward. And I think that modernized agenda would start with revitalizing our democracies at home, our economic competitiveness and resilience, and building citizen-to-citizen -citizen ties, and building ties between our cities and subnational uh, players, because that's a really important part of diplomacy. I think we need to shore up our, our economic uh, relationship. Uh, that means not having, uh, not you know, hitting each other with tariffs, but actually thinking creatively about trade agreements for the 21st century, about coordinating our economic recovery packages, deconflicting our, our, our travel restrictions, and thinking about research and development together, how we can push the curve of discovery. And then I think we have a set of challenges globally, especially when it comes to transnational challenges like climate change and pandemics, but also the rise of China. And I think on this question, uh, there are some disagreements between the United States and European partners and allies, but I also see a convergence of interest. I also see a recognition that the rise of China presents a whole host of challenges, uh, but we need to be smart. We need to do this uh, clear-eyed. We need to balance competition and cooperation, but we need to work together to try to shape the environment into which China rises. And I think American and its European partners can do that effectively. We need to have high standard trade agreements. We need to work with allies and partners in the Asia Pacific. We need to set high standards for new technologies. Uh, and we need to work on, on, on issues like sustainability, uh, and reach out and deepen partnerships with new players in the region, especially with, with Southeast Asia, uh, Japan, South Korea, and Australia. Uh, and so there's a whole host of things that I can do uh, that we can do, uh, but we, we have to do it together. And I think it involves uh, having a long-term sense of our interest. So when it comes to global institutions like the WTO and the WHO, I think America uh, can re-engage multilaterally with these institutions and work with European partners to make them more effective. Uh, and there are a lot of ideas out there about how to help institutions like the WTO think clearly about the new rules uh, that it might need for, for the 21st century, how to deal with the appellate judges issue, how to deal with the distinction between developed and developing countries. Uh, there are a whole set of reforms, but I've always believed, as someone who grew up a transatlantic kid, that we are more effective when we work with our allies and partners to reform these institutions together. And, and, and that to me is, is how we move forward uh, with purpose, especially on challenges like China. And my sense is that if America moves forward cooperatively, works effectively through multilateral institutions and with its partners, and if our European partners also understand that, that power is still important in the world, and that they will have to shore up their defense and deterrence, even as we move toward more cooperative arrangements. 
this this meeting of minds will really help us find a point of concurrence in our relationship. And I think there's so much that we we gain when we work together. We have complementary capabilities and we have shared values. So that's that's a good foundation for moving forward. Thank you. Thank you so much both to to for for kicking off uh this this fascinating uh discussion. Uh, I wonder if I could ask you to to elaborate on on a couple of uh points that come to mind as a as you put forward these um this plea in a way for for renewed uh cooperation and and uh between uh democracies and and beyond of course. And on, on the one hand, um, it's the issue of um, legitimacy within, within uh, foreign policy. These challenges, they seem to require solutions that are both you know, domestic and uh, global uh, in nature. And um, I'm wondering how, how do you see uh, the path ahead in terms of making the US uh, let's say more resilient, um, and in terms of its institutional setup, but also more resilient in terms of dealing with new transnational threats that it's that it's uh, faced with in kind of two main areas. On the one hand, kind of deliberate disruptions uh, from um, actors such as China or, or, or Russia, and on the other hand just the state of interconnectedness and, and cross border flows. And so the challenges that come from migration, for example, or uh, for instance, the, the, the global pandemic. And then uh, another issue uh, I think is kind of the, the waning, uh, what I would argue kind of the waning normative pull of, of Western values, democracy, liberalism and, and so forth. I think there is something to be said uh, when it comes to, um, at least since 2008, the great rebalancing and the rise of uh, competing uh, actors has um, kind of affected the ability of the West to uh, influence normatively the rest of the world. And this is a question, of course, that uh, also European countries face. And so when the patronage is not no longer uh, monopolized by the West and financial resources, of course, come from other countries such as, such as China, where, where does the West stand when it comes to its ability to really influence um, other actors in the, in the global arena? Perhaps we can start with these two, two questions and then go to the audience uh, for some further, further discussion. Great, great. Well, I, I think these are important because in some ways the two questions are linked. Our resilience and capacity at home, I think, is really tied to our ability to be effective in the world uh, and to deal with this question of legitimacy that you raised. So let me, let me start with the, the topic of resilience. I, I think in many ways, COVID-19 is more than just an epidemiological virus. It's a, it's a social virus, a political virus, an economic virus. It held up a mirror to our society in America and revealed real challenges. It revealed challenges about our own uh, divides between urban and rural, our political polarization, our economic inequities, uh, our deficits in resilience and infrastructure. Uh, and so to me, to move forward, resilience has to be a core part of our renewal agenda. And to do that, I think there, there are a number of things that we can try to think about. Uh, the first is that our, our social compact at home really has to be repaired. And this social compact means that we're, we're not just investing uh, you know, in, in the future, but we're investing in the workforce of the future, that we're investing in uh, the foundation of our power, which is our middle class. And you know, there's been uh, some projects at leading think tanks in the United States, like the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, to think through how do we have a foreign policy that works for the middle class. And for me, if there's one lesson I take from the last couple of years, it's that we have to have a broad base of public support 
for our, our, our country to be successful in the world. Uh, and so what does that mean? I think part of that means broadening our sense of national security. So often we focus on the big threats and on traditional challenges, but sometimes it's these, these very small threats and challenges like a virus, uh, like emissions uh, that, that can have a real, real impact. So we have to broaden our sense of national security to include climate change and pandemics. That really matters. Uh, we have to think through how do we uh, fund the institutions that allow us to do that, like the CDC. By one count, uh, you know, we spend $180 billion on, on countering terrorism, which remains a priority and it has to remain a focus. But we spend something like just a few billion on infectious diseases. Uh, and yet an infectious disease has uh, shut down our economy and taken over 200,000 American lives and many more lives around the world. And so we have to sort of rebalance our national security toolkit, rebalance our sense of, of investments. Right now, I, I think this also means that we need to make sure that we are working with other countries effectively on a resilience agenda. And this really could be an opportunity for NATO and for the European Union uh, to focus on resilience. I think they have different roles and responsibilities when it comes to this question, but we could be doing a lot more on, on planning for, for coastal protection and water management uh, and climate change. We could be doing a lot more on pandemic preparedness together. There's the Euro-Atlantic Disaster uh, Center that we have together. Uh, I think the European Union is really important in this regard. One of the, I think, messages for, for America is that the, we, we benefit from a strong, prosperous, outward-looking European Union. And that relationship between the United States and Europe is really important. And the EU has been, has been doing a lot. I mean, it's faced so many crises of late, uh, whether that's uh, in, in Brexit, in the migration crisis, uh, in the Eurozone crisis, uh, and now with, with uh, COVID-19 and the recovery package. Uh, and the EU uh, has been, has been uh, dealing with those challenges. And I think America benefits with a strong relationship with the European Union. Uh, and we see that the European Union has real strengths on many issues that we care about, whether that's on technology protection, uh, whether that's on resilience, on energy, on economics. And so I do think uh, mm -hmm. for Europe to be uh, an effective actor, the EU really matters. And having a, a real sense of, uh, of a strategic orientation in partnership with America will really benefit uh, all of us. <clears throat> Resilience really matters. Let me just say a word about legitimacy. You know, I do think that power without consent, power without legitimacy isn't sustainable. And so one of America's great strengths has been to realize that if it works effectively in the world, and binds itself to certain rules and institutions, works effectively with other partners, and creates a stable rules-based framework that makes relations in the world just a little bit more predictable, just a little bit more orderly. We, we all benefit from that. And the challenge is that these institutions need to be fit for purpose. They need to adapt to the times. Uh, and so that, that remains a real challenge. One of the things that I'll share from my book is that I actually trace the origins of what's called the liberal international order, these norms, institutions, agreements, and institutions we set up after World War II. I trace in some ways the intellectual origins to the US Declaration of Independence. And one of the interesting things about this founding document of America is that the principles it articulated were universal, but the powers at the time were concentrated in just a few hands. And so over time, part of the American project has been to widen that circle of rights, widen the ability of, of the powers to be shared by other people, by, by the many, not just by the few. And so this project in a way mirrors the project of the liberal order. You know, in some ways this order started out as just an Atlantic project. Uh, it sort of, um, it sort of, uh, sort of de declined in the 1970s and then it expanded globally in the 1990s. And what I see is sort of the prospect of what one scholar called norm governed change. I think many of the norms that comprise the liberal order really do matter. They're at the heart of free and open societies, protecting individual rights, you know, gender equality, protecting uh, our environment. These are all important, important things. Uh, but I think we need to adapt the rules and procedures so that we make sure that other countries are engaged and involved and then make sure that these institutions stay legitimate in the eyes of the people of the world. And so to me, this idea that we need to take uh, the norms and values that, that have served free and open societies so well, and we need to make sure we're bringing other countries in because these, these values uh, are, are global. Many countries uh, around the world 
have, have, have been involved in articulating these principles on environmental issues, on gender equality and non-discrimination. Uh, and so this isn't, this isn't just an American or European project, it's a global project. And I think we have to do more to consolidate the source of our strength and resilience at home so we can project outward sustainably and work with these other countries to make sure that these norms are protected for the future. So to me, that's that crucial link that you posited between resilience and getting our, our own houses in order, Americans, Europeans, and partners and allies around the world, but then working together to make sure that we have a new sort of project for uh, refounding our, our global institutions uh, in the 21st century. And I think we can do that. It's, uh, it's just a question of whether we have the will to do it and whether we can see our interests clearly enough to know we have to work together. We can't just do this uh, on our own, uh, separate from one another or in isolation. Thank you. Thank you for your, your reply. It's a very insightful reply to that. Uh, Ambassador Vandal, any, any further comments before we, we go to the audience questions? Uh, just uh, one uh, footnote. Talking about values, the American democracy was invented in the 18th century. European democracy generally were invented in the 19th century, which allowed them to add the social dimension, which is practically everywhere and which reduces the uh, inequalities in society and is something which we hope will arrive in the United States as well. President Obama started that in a way, and it should continue because, yes, we share liberal values. I'm not so sure that we share historically social values, and that in itself creates a number of rifts between the two sides of the Atlantic, rifts which, of course, we have to cross and to bridge. I would, I would just, I would just share. You know, I think this question of uh, of values is really important. And right now, inequality, uh, to me, is one of those challenges from COVID that that really does uh, threaten to reshape uh, dynamics much for the worse. If if you look at our country, the in America, you know, the statistics on on inequality are really troubling. Uh, you know, 0.1 percent controlling 25 percent of the national wealth. Uh, it, you know, it, it, the it, it's for me, you, you cannot have, be a cohesive as a country with extraordinarily high levels of inequality. And so part of the debate uh, in America right now, and I, and I would just share, there are many Americans who believe that you know, we really need to address uh, this question of inequality. We need to address the question of healthcare, of childcare, of, of education, uh, to make sure that people have a ladder up. Uh, because you know, right now, really, we're we're a divided country, but the world is in disarray. And to be able to deal with both of those problems, we need to make sure that we are we are cohesive, that we have we have an economic agenda at home that's broadly shared, that's inclusive, uh, and that recognizes some of the new challenges that we face. That means that we have to focus on on manufacturing, but also on services, which which employ many many Americans. We have to focus uh, on on families who need childcare. We have to think about new geographies in the country, how to deal with this divide between urban and rural. And we have to really reimagine our uh, public-private partnerships, our research and innovation ecosystems. Because for me, this is an agenda that, that really holds a lot of promise. You know, one of the great things that we can do uh, in America is that we're, we're an in innovative and entrepreneurial society, but there are many more actors involved in innovation today. So during the Cold War, the U.S. government drove research and development, and the private sector was was only a smaller share of that. And today, that's flipped. Uh, whereas, sort of, the the U.S. government had about sort of two thirds of R and D, uh, and the private sector had about a third. It's now flipped, and the private sector is driving much of the innovation. So, the United States government has a really important role to play in marshaling resources, in coordinating action, in setting timelines, and in focusing investment on areas that aren't always attended to by the private sector. But we have to recognize that industry, philanthropy, and academia, and state and local governments play a big role in the innovation agenda. And so I think there's also a task for, for the U.S. government to really reimagine its innovation ecosystem, and then at home to do that in the world as well with our partners. I think together with our allies and partners, we comprise about two-thirds of global R&D. That's an extraordinary 
pool of investment where we could be thinking more collaboratively and innovatively about, well, where do we need to innovate as democracies to help shore up our societies, to make sure that growth is broadly shared, and to make sure that we're, we're strong uh, as democracies. And that's a real opportunity. And I think that's a, a case where if America and Europe uh, could have a, a deeper dialogue to think more creatively about the future of technology in the 21st century, a future that innovates effectively and protects our data and our privacy, I think we can do that. Uh, but that's going to require serious conversations and a willingness to recognize that, that we can work effectively together and that we're stronger if we work together. So, you know, this has been my, my message for today, but I'm, I'm really glad that, that you and the ambassador brought this up because I, I think innovation is also at the heart of this renewal project that I, that I talked about earlier. Thank you once again. And I think we're now ready to move to our audience questions. Uh, we have a couple of questions from Juan Diego, who asks, um, are cyber warfare and disinformation campaigns a significant threat to international liberalism? What measures should the US and its allies take to increase the liberal system's re resilience once again? to the potentially significant destabilizing effects. And more specifically, again, from Juan Diego, uh, what measures should the United States and its allies um, take to strengthen the system's resilience against the, the proliferation of these um, threats? And is it as big a threat as it is sometimes made out? Let me, I, I, maybe I could share a few things and then, and then uh, if the ambassador, you would like to, to share anything too, I'd be very interested to hear. I would say, let me say a few things about, about the, the challenge on cyber and on, on uh, disinformation. The, the first is that uh, there's a, a great book, The Hacker and the State, written by a scholar Ben Buchanan. And one of the findings from this book is that, you know, sometimes we look for a cyber Pearl Harbor. We look for sort of the big events that crystallized this threat, but really these, these threats, these challenges happen day to day. It's part of a new normal in geopolitics. And, and many of these challenges uh, will require uh, institutional changes to be more resilient, will require foresight, new capabilities, uh, and it will require us again to work together uh, to deal with these challenges because they do have consequences. Although I will say that one of the lessons from history is that often the people who propagate these attacks uh, tend to exaggerate their strategic effects. And if democracies uh, also exaggerate, exaggerate them, then we do the work for them. And we need to make sure that we keep a level head. We need to make sure that we prepare accordingly, that we have strong defenses, that we're shoring up our resilience and showing no tolerance for election interference. We also need to make sure that we're keeping everything in perspective and that we're not overreacting by exaggerating the strategic effects of these kinds of, uh, of attacks and, and challenges. So it's a real balancing act, uh, but I'm, I'm still confident we can meet it. I mean, some of the challenge is, is old. You know, the, the challenge of disinformation uh, and propaganda goes back a long way. But what is new is that some of the new technologies that we're seeing uh, can accelerate and exacerbate this challenge, can blur the lines between domestic and foreign, between the producers and consumers of information. So what we're seeing now is new technologies like in AI, generative adversarial networks that can create these what are called deep fakes or uh, synthetic video and audio that seem very realistic. Uh, and uh, there's still real challenges here. Uh, there are many people trying to do more on detection, but these, are, these could be cheaper alternatives. They could be rapidly scaled. Uh, you don't need as much uh, labor. Uh, they're hard to detect. And they're in formats that are very persuasive. You know, video is very persuasive. And so this is a real challenge that democracies will have to wrestle with. We have people uh, in the U.S. government and in the private sector who are working to, to try to detect these. But that's going to be a real challenge. The other challenge is just, just the terrain on which these, uh, these attacks take place. It's a terrain uh, in the Internet uh, and in social media that's governed by machine learning algorithms. Uh, and these algorithms govern uh, what you see on your feed. Uh, you know what you watch uh, on YouTube, uh, and they and they and they play a big role in shaping the environment of the internet. And sometimes, you know, a long time ago, people would have to people who are interested in the in disinformation would have to cultivate sources over a long time. It was a much more artisanal effort. 
And now uh, I think the real threat is sort of the industrialization of disinformation on, on a much bigger scale. Uh, and we have to make sure that we're, we're shoring up our, our defenses and our strengths and our resilience uh, against this. Some of that means bolstering local uh, journalism, having much better open source science and technology monitoring, public alert systems, making sure that we have good detection, that we're working effectively in multilateral institutions, uh, both to do uh, sort of stress tests uh, and planning for these kinds of events, but also to make sure that we're, we're standing <clears throat> strong for our values. Uh, and then we need to really think about how the public and private sectors uh, can work together to defend against these challenges, both in Europe uh, and the United States. Uh, but I think this remains, this is one of those 21st century challenges at the nexus of disinformation and technology that democracies really need to focus on. They just need to do it uh, with a level head and with confidence uh, in their purpose. And so I would just, I would just share that because I, I do, I'm glad the question was asked because it's one of those areas where I think the European Union uh, has done work on this. European countries have experience in this. Uh, so does America, and we could be sharing best practices and lessons learned in a much more uh, rigorous and regular fashion. I think that would benefit benefit us both. Thank you. Thank you for that. Ambassador Vandal, do you have any? Just, <clears throat> just to, to add uh, a marginal uh, remark on uh, cyber warfare. Cyber warfare is dangerous. We should not exaggerate it, but it it really can make a difference. And uh, as usual, democracies are a bit uh, slow in the uptake. We always have been before reacting because, well, uh, uh, decision making in democracies uh, takes time. There are two things which uh, we should do better. First of all, something which is now in its infancy stage in the United States, which is putting filters into the social media to try and weed out the most uh, excessive uh, disinformation. The second point is, to, to my mind, even important, we should start learning to use uh, social media to get correct news and correct uh, considerations out because we have basically left the social media during 10 years at least in the hands of disinformation. I think the moment has come we are all now aware of the dangers and I think through filters on the one hand through giving out more correct information we probably can turn the tide. That's all. Thank you. We have several more more questions from our audience. Um, starting from a, a, a broader question from Professor Michelle Egan, who asks, well, how do you position yourself, uh, Andrew, as compared to uh, Paul's, Paul Kennedy's uh, argument on you know, the rise and fall of, of great powers? Um, and she asks further, is there an assumption that others will accept US leadership, given, on the other hand, the diminished credibility and trust among allies uh, over the past four years? So let me, uh, th thank you for the question. So I, I, my sense is that at the end of the Cold War, we were poised for a big debate about first principles. Uh, in, in U.S. foreign policy, but also uh, in our alliances. And Paul Kennedy's book, The Rise and Fall of, of the Great Powers, raised a number of critical questions for this debate. One of them being the most important is the critical link between military power and economic power. And one of his arguments was that often in history, what we would see is countries' defense commitments would outstrip their available resources. And he saw that America, as in great powers past, was facing potentially the relative erosion of its capabilities, and it needed to make sure that it didn't take short-term measures that ended up having a long-term negative effect for its power and purpose in the world. And he had many historical case studies to sort of en enrich this debate. 
I think his book was one of a number of contributions about how America could use its power wisely in a new world. I do think in the 1990s, there was, a, in a sense, a sort of post-Cold War triumphalism uh, that said that democracy and a certain brand of capitalism were destined to spread around the world. And not everybody held this view. Uh, there were countercurrents in the debate, but I think it was prevalent enough that it induced a certain historical amnesia uh, and a reluctance to grapple with these new and difficult realities. So in some sense, uh, what's needed today is to kind of bring these insights forward in light of what we've learned and what's since happened. Uh, and so there's been uh, you know, a number of, of major shifts in the global landscape since then. And so our question today is how do we better balance our military and economic capabilities for the long term? How do we shore up our institutions? On this question of legitimacy, you know, my, my argument in the book is that uh, the world is changing. We live in what I call in the book a post-dominant world. This is a world where power is more contested. The rules of the road are less fixed. Influence is harder to wield. Uh, and the global order will be more patchwork, more fragmented. And free and open societies will need to work effectively together. Now, I don't think America and its allies were always dominant, always got their way. I think that's sort of a myth of history. They always face challenges. But I do think some things different today. And, and that's my argument in the book, is we live in a sort of a post-dominant world, which means we need to shift our strategy from a strategy of dominance, where we try to dominate everywhere all the time in all spaces, to a strategy of leadership that works effectively with our allies and partners. Mm -hmm. you know, I think words matter a great deal, especially mm -hmm. when consistently expressed, and deeds matter even more. And my sense is that if America uh, reshore, you know, shores up its uh, economic competitiveness and resilience and that of its allies. If we uh, you know, work on our democratic project at home and show that it can deliver for citizens and then lead effectively, multilaterally, recommit to our alliances and reimagine what they can do, you know, that's how you build legitimacy. That's how you build action that's perceived as credible with the world. Uh, if, you, if you don't just uh, lecture but listen and learn from each other, and try to move toward each other because that's to me how leadership is most sustainable. And so, you know, to your question, I just I just share that that we have uh, we had a debate that we were poised for uh, at the end of the Cold War. We need to bring that debate forward. We need to ask these hard questions and then think about how the democratic project can renew itself. Uh, and I think that will bring uh, legitimacy, and that's going to be really important for dealing with these challenges of cyber uh, disinformation and all the other issues that we've been talking about today. Ambassador, you have the floor if you would like to add anything. Well, <clears throat> just uh, again, uh, a simple footnote to remarks which uh, by and large I, I fully, fully share. The, uh, to, be, <clears throat> to have leadership, you need something else, which is not fellowship, but fellowship. And that situation has existed in the past. I remember very much when I started out as a young diplomat, how often the United States conferred, and particularly with Germany. I think in these days, the influence on American foreign policy coming out of Berlin, Bonn at the time, was uh, quite, quite meaningful. And again, if we want, if the United the United States will be will not be capable to uh, exert leadership if it doesn't have a fellowship, and in order to have a fellowship, you have to talk with people. You need a nervous system uh, across the Atlantic, if I may say so. It's perfectly doable, but it has to be done. And perhaps related to this, in some ways, uh, the picture that you've been painting, Andrew, is in quite removed, let's say, from what we have experienced over the past four years. And um, there are many questions that, of course, the current administration has raised in terms of how it approaches these global challenges and, and how, in some ways at least, it really represents. Uh, a change of course, a reversal 
in many ways uh, along these these kinds of trajectories and um, specifically with, in this regard uh, Daniel Shellbasher um, makes reference to how the US reportedly ignored the 75th UN anniversary sending a second ranking diplomat to its jubilee uh, conference and he opposes this to, for example, how in 1945 the US um, lobbied for a veto in the Security Council, uh, albeit adding Article 109C, thus accepting to call in a Charter Review Conference by 1955, which never took place. And then he asks, does the US really share global values and solutions for global problems, such as nuclear proliferation, inequality, climate action, pandemics, trade, health, and so on. So one thing I think that's helpful to think about when looking at the US is that really no, no, no country is, is one single actor. We're all sort of much more complicated. Uh, there, there are many different voices uh, and many different uh, interests at stake. There's bureaucratic politics and it often, it helps to sort of see the diversity uh, of every country and to understand uh, that they're they're not really centralized monoliths, but they're they're complicated entities. Uh, in America, you know, we have we have different traditions, different schools of thought. Uh, you know, one interesting book about American foreign policy talks about different schools: the Jacksonian school, the Hamiltonian school, the Wilsonian school, and the Jeffersonian school. These are named after presidents who had sort of a different. A sense of America's domestic policy and place in the world. They represented different regional and sectoral interests. And what this book argued was that it was really always these schools competing, cooperating with one another, and that over time, uh, one of the strengths of our country was that the diversity of these schools and these sometimes very contentious debates often produce a foreign policy that tries to approximate the interests of the American people. Sometimes one school is in ascendance and other schools have, have fallen back and you see different combinations over time. And I think it's helpful to look at the US that way. We're really a big diverse country. And right now in the middle of our elections, you're seeing a whole range of opinions and views. Uh, but what I will say is that for many years, uh, for decades after the Second World War, you know, we had sort of a, a, sent a couple bargains in place about how we approach the world. Uh, in one sense, there was a realist hard power bargain that said, America's power is going to be more effective if we lead in the world and our allies buy into that leadership, that they give us access to their markets, that they uh, provide resources for us. And in return, we will help with security. We will help provide a sense of stability uh, in the world. There were also liberal bargains at play. You know, the United States recognized from the past that it couldn't just uh, dominate, it had to also agree to abide by certain rules and institutions, which is why it's set up many of these multilateral institutions that the questioner cites and that we've been talking about today. Uh, and for, for many decades, there was you know always disagreement, but there was this sort of broad-based bargain that we benefited from these multilateral institutions and agreements that we were, in a way, making a, an investment in our shared future. It wasn't just about doing what was immediately uh, available in the short term. It was about long-term interests. Uh, and I think this is a tradition that really served us well. But what I think some of the lessons that we've learned in the last couple of years is that, again, if this is going to be a sustainable uh, approach, we need to make sure that we're not leaving people behind, that there is a broad sense of public support. And what that means is that democracies have to show that this liberal order that we talk about really delivers for people, that there is a sense of, of cohesion, of, of economic quality, that there are opportunities that we can forge to so take trade agreements. Uh, you know, I do think we benefit from having high standard trade agreements that set the rules of the road for international commerce, especially in the digital age. And again, I think this is an area where if America and Europe work well together, this really makes a difference. It magnifies our power. But these agreements, these rules, we need to make sure that the interests at the table are diverse and representative. So it doesn't just mean the big companies, but also labor and environmental groups and small businesses. It means we need to have a strategy for enforcement. We can't just have rules, but then not have them enforced. We need to think about uh, harmonizing our, and thinking about international tax policy. 
know, how do we do transition assistance? How do we make sure that when we make these agreements, those that don't always benefit really are in a position to succeed? So we have long-term workforce training and development for people at home. Maybe even thinking about those questions early on before, you know, before we conclude these agreements, thinking about how we can help our people adapt and adjust. And then really working with our European partners. I think we have the opportunity to have a real trade agenda together with the Europeans and move away from sort of uh, blunt, force, blunt force tariffs and actually have a, a real vision for a rules-based uh, trading order. Uh, and this, I think, can, can really start with negotiations between America and Europeans. Uh, and so again, this just gets to the point that I think this multilateral rule-based order we set up has served us well. We just have to think about how to adapt it for a new era in a way that uh, bolsters our, our middle classes and our workers at home uh, as well so that it's sustainable. And I, I think we've, we've been served well by it. And I just encourage listeners to sort of see America and all the diversity that it is and all the voices that it has as part of this debate. Uh, and that I think these, uh, you know, that there's this uh, principle of multilateralism uh, really is an important one in our tradition. Ambassador, back to you. It's okay. I will go ahead then with our next um, question, which very much ties into what you were referring to now, Andrew, which is, you know, how how do we rebuild American leadership within the current framework of global uh, international institutions? And we have Gustavo Muller asking, you know, how do you see the interaction between these trade-offs of American foreign policy uh, within organizations such as the United Nations, uh, the WTO, uh, and other organizations that rep represent this kind of post-war uh, liberal uh, consensus? Can the US reassert its leadership within these institutions, or do they need more fundamental reform, in your view? Well, I think the the, the trade-offs are, are really uh, ever-present, and that's really what my book is about, is all these choices involve trade-offs. Uh, and I think that it's just, it's the, when we think about our, our statesmen and women, our policymakers who confront these, um, it, they're really difficult. And it, it, every choice in my book that I talk about, there are no really easy answers. Uh, and so there's there's always a sense that this is part of an ongoing debate. I do think, uh, that we are uh, we are stronger when we are thinking about how to reform these institutions. As I said, they have to be fit for purpose. Uh, and my sense is that on the one hand, democracies have uh, a resilience task ahead of them at home, but then they also have to show greater solidarity among them in the world. And I do think there are gonna be a set of rules, a, a sort of a thick bargaining, a thick set of rules that we can develop uh, among democracies and then we have to think broader, okay, well, what are the kinds of rules then that we can try to agree to globally? And obviously it's gonna be harder to do globally. There's a whole diversity of interest, mm -hmm. um, but I do think that these institutions matter. Uh, and if you think about global financial crises, if you think about pandemics, you know, we, we need to be able to work with other countries to solve them because again, no country can deal with this on its own. We have to have information sharing and not isolation. We need to make sure that we are working uh, with our partners. So to me, there's there's no choice but to figure out how to make these work. Uh, and the question is, how do we adapt? I think, you know, I laid out earlier a few of the ideas about the WTO. You know, I think, again, uh, whether we're looking at different UN institutions or the WHO uh, or the IMF or the World Bank, uh, these these are in our interest. And I think that there are a lot of good ideas that scholars and practitioners have been working on to try to reform these institutions. But I'll just say again, I do think it's effective when America and its European partners and allies and other partners and allies in the Asia Pacific try to work together in these institutions to push a reform agenda. I think we our voices are stronger that way uh, and we're more likely to craft rules that are clear uh, and legitimate uh, and perceived as legitimate by, by other countries uh, if we if we embark on that reform agenda. So some of that means how do we make them more representative? How do we make sure that other countries have a voice in these institutions? As one scholar said, these institutions were meant to be easy to join and hard to overturn. So I do think that making them representative is important, 
but we also have to ask the question, how do we make them more effective? It's not, it's not just about broadening the number of voices, it's also about making sure that they can, they're nimble, that they're agile, and that they can adapt to these new challenges, whether it's in the digital world and, and technology issues, or whether that's trade and investment regimes, or on climate. Uh, and so again, I think we are uh, more effective if we have these early conversations uh, with our allies to say, what do we want the, the WHO to do in the world? What do we want uh, our UN agencies to be doing? How do we make sure we fund them effectively? And also uh, that those dollars and, and euros uh, and that funding is going to the right ends. And so some of what uh, I think is really important to focus on is not just means but ends. What are our objectives? What do we want these institutions to do? Uh, and then how do we how do we get there? And so I think it's 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 really what is a roadmap for for democracies uh, to reform our multi multilateral and institutional heritage from the 20th century? And uh, we benefit when we when we think ahead about that. I have a question which. Uh, addresses one of the kind of key challenges in a way of uh, in terms of global global leadership, which is China. And um, it refers to your approach of kind of these historical uh, comparisons. And um, the the uh, audience member asks, what lessons do you draw from the British policy towards a rising United States? in the late uh, 19th, early 20th century. To what extent are there lessons that we can draw for American foreign policy towards China? And perhaps uh, you, can, you can tell us a little bit more about this relationship more broadly from your perspective. Absolutely. So I think there are a number of interesting case uh, lessons from, from how Britain managed a rising America. Uh, and then we'll get into how applicable they are to the present moment. I think it's often forgotten how tense and antagonistic this relationship was in the early 19th, uh, uh, in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, but then as of 1870, 1871, uh, there started to be a rapprochement between a rising America and, and Great Britain. They left the Canadian border undefended. Uh, there was a negotiated agreement on the Venezuelan boundary dispute toward the end of the 19th century. Uh, Britain uh, supported the United States in the Spanish-American War. Uh, they negotiated on the Alaskan boundary dispute. So there was a whole set of agreements uh, and negotiations and compromises on sort of new terms of order. And this was important. I think British leaders adapted and tried to display skillful statecraft. They balanced resources and commitments. In many respects, their leaders tried to have a long-term view about their challenges. Part of the challenge was a rising Germany. So there was a rising naval power uh, in, prox in proximity to the British. And so they had to be smart about how they how they balanced their commitments uh, and what America could do for for Britain that had to have uh, sort of deal with near term competitors. Uh, so those are those are all important lessons. But one thing I'll share is that there was also a similarity in in culture and in regime type between the United States and the UK, uh, which meant, as one scholar uh, has shown in in a book uh, called Safe Passage, that they worried less about the relative power differences between each other and more about the absolute power that they could bring to bear against challenges in the world. And that made a difference. You know, we've seen in history that institutional restraint and certain sort of cultural and political commonality uh, has made it easier to agree on shared rules. Uh, and so the question is, you know, are those conditions present in the US-China relationship today? And obviously there's, there's a great deal of difference between the US model uh, and, and what the what China is is doing right now, my sense is that we have to be uh, strategic. We have to be smart about how we manage this challenge with our allies and partners. So the first thing I'll say is that I think we do need to start at home. We need to be confident in our purpose and invest in the sources of our economic strength and resilience. I've said that a lot because it really matters. And I think if we're investing at home then we're, we're strong to meet this challenge. And we can do it with not be reactive, we can do it with, with confidence. And the second is I think this, this challenge has to be something that we do with our allies and partners. Uh, it's, it, it is sometimes easy to think about it uh, in bilateral terms as the US and China, but one of the America's great advantages, one of its great strengths is this broad network of democracies around the world. 
that can really help us set the rules of the road. And I mentioned earlier that we needed a shaping strategy. I think the idea here is something that one of our, our great statesmen, uh, Ambassador uh, Bill Burns, uh, who used to be the Deputy Secretary of State at the State Department, has said, which is instead of trying to shape the internal trajectory of China, uh, over which I don't think we have much influence and is unlikely to be successful, what we need to do is try to shape the environment into which it rises. And that's why it's so important to work with allies to set those high standard trade agreements, to work with other countries in the Asia Pacific who are trying to create a less China-centric regional order, so a different kind of equilibrium. It's important we backstop investments uh, in other parts of the Asia Pacific, like the, the Southeast Asian uh, partners. Uh, and, we, and we really need to think about the future of technology and how we define high standards for that too. And so this shaping strategy, I think, is in our wheelhouse. It's something we can do effectively, but we need to invest at home. We need to work with allies and partners. And then I'll just share two more things. One is that, in a way, uh, this is a contest of models. You know, this is, this is a, 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 an opportunity for democracies to show that it can deliver for its people, which means that we need to live up to high standards at home. We need to make sure that we're instantiating our values, uh, whether that's on questions of technology uh, and surveillance, or whether that's on questions of economic growth uh, and stability. And so that's gonna be really uh, important. And the final thing I'll just say is that we can't deal with many transnational challenges unless we deal with them together. And that doesn't just mean US and its allies, it also means the US has to find ways for pragmatic cooperation with China on climate change, on pandemics. Uh, and so that's gonna require statecraft. That's, that's the challenge of statecraft is how do you balance a competition and cooperation? This has always been part of America's relationship with China, uh, but I do think that the terms of that are changing. It's gonna be a sharper relationship, more competitive. There will be more friction. Uh, but what, one thing I think that's important is uh, for Americans uh, to, to recognize that, that multilateralism working with our allies is in our advantage. And also for European partners now is to recognize we live in a geopolitical world, that there are challenges that, that are geopolitical, that, that, that fundamental security questions do sometimes shape the terms of cooperation on transnational challenges. And so to be strong, like I said earlier, I think we need to move toward each other. We need to have a sense that cooperation and multilateralism is in our interest and also that we face fundamental geopolitical realities. And for the European member states of the European Union to benefit from a free and open world, a world where ideas, goods, services, and people uh, are able to, to move, we also need to make sure we defend that free and open world and that we, have, uh, we link arms effectively uh, to deal with those difficult realities as well. So I think this, this will really make a difference, but it will require uh, subtle strategies and, and a real investment in statecraft. Ambassador, do you have any, any comments on this? Yes, if, the, uh, if, and it's a big if, if the United States wants to rebuild some form of leadership, and I say it's a, an if, but if it wants to do so, uh, the recipe is quite simple. First of all, the United States should return to the climate agreements of Paris, should return even on adjusted terms to the uh, agreement with uh, Iran. It should stop using the United Nations as a punching ball, and it should talk in earnest to a lot of countries, not only the Europeans, but dialogue should be everywhere. And I'm aware this is a tall order, even for a Biden administration, if it were to come about. Um, but the ball about multilateralism is in the camp of the United States once again. Thank you, Ambassador. And I know we've managed to stay away from the uh, upcoming elections, but of course they they will be uh, defining one way or another for the next uh, few years at least. Um, can I can I draw both of you to kind of give us some potential scenarios post post election scenarios, in particular when it comes from point of view of, of the United States uh, in the world. 
Well, I just say I, you know, I can't speak for either of the campaigns, uh, but what my sense is that there are major choices uh, at stake right now uh, for the country, and we've seen, you know, at most elections, people will say this is a defining moment, a shaping moment for the country. But I really do feel that that this election is incredibly important uh, for our future, but also for the future of of people and countries around the world. I do think that uh, we can make, uh, you know, it's always it's always sort of hazardous to predict the future, but I think some trend lines are, are clear. I think if uh, you know if we see uh, the current administration stay in office, uh, you know, we we know what to expect. We've seen that over the last couple of years. Uh, we know what the trend lines are. I think we'll see a deepening and acceleration of those trend lines, but potentially uh, some new some new areas. I do think that uh, we have to think about uh, what the future of our alliances will be in that scenario, what the future of our multilateralism will be uh, in that scenario. Uh, and you're more likely to see an approach that focuses on, on bilateral relationships uh, than multilateral relationships under the current administration. Uh, but I do think if if you see a President Biden, uh, you will see a return to multilateralism. You will see a reinvigoration, a reimagining of our alliances. I think you will see a much greater emphasis on on democracy. Uh, and President Vice President Biden has uh, said that in the first year uh, of his office, if he were to be elected, he would have a summit of democracies. Uh, and I certainly think there's a whole agenda for us to, to work on as democracies as we've laid out today. I also think uh, you mentioned the, the Paris Climate Agreement. I mean, that, that has to be a priority. And I think you would see a much greater emphasis, obviously, uh, in a Biden administration on climate leadership. You know, for, by my lights, that means uh, diplomatic leadership in the Paris Agreement. It also means leadership on a clean energy innovation agenda, uh, how to make sure that we are leading uh, on on solar, on wind, uh, you know, in other areas, because this really is the future. There are enormous investment opportunities with with clean energy, uh, and it's a chance for America and its allies to to lead to create sustainable jobs. And again, this is an area where you know America only uh, comprises you know 15% of emissions. We have to work with other countries, with the EU, with China, with India, with others to set the agenda. We need to think about sustainable financing uh, for developing countries. Uh, we need to think about resilience. There's a whole host of, of challenges that require a multilateral cooperation. I think you'd see a very strong commitment to that uh, under a Biden administration. And I just say, finally, you'd, you'd really, I think, see uh, this question of how do we make sure that our foreign policy works for the middle class? You know, right now, for all the viewers who are in Europe and around the world, you know, America obviously is facing a public health challenge, an economic uh, challenge and crisis. Uh, and you know political polarization. These are these are major challenges at home. And when you are president, you don't get to sort of pick and choose. You have to you have to be able to manage simultaneously. But America is really going to have to deal with this question of 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 COVID-19, how to how to bounce back. And I do think you would see uh, under a Biden administration a real commitment to a comprehensive national plan for testing, tracing, getting uh, personal protective equipment to the people who need it. Uh, how to coordinate vaccines, not just on the development side, but the production, manufacturing, and distribution. I think for all of us watching, this has to be a, a major challenge is not just how do we get the vaccines as soon as possible, but make sure that they're safe, make sure that we're distributing them, uh, manufacturing them, because that's going to be a real challenge, not just for Americans and Europeans, but globally. I mean, one of the real uh, challenges from COVID-19 has been that it threatens to push many, many people back into extreme poverty in the world and so we have to have a global agenda as well about how to how to make sure that this uh this is uh we're caring for people who are the most vulnerable and then really preparing for the future that's already here we're going to see pandemics uh, again unless we really uh prepare accordingly and so i think all of that is is at stake right now uh very different uh choices uh, at play and i do think the world is watching uh and so by my lights uh this is a an enormous moment. It's a, and I think I hope everybody is uh, keeps faith with with the promise of of America and what it can do, uh, because it's it's something that I think plays to the aspirations of people all over the world. Thank you, thank you so much for that, uh, Ambassador. Any any final uh, reflections? 
I agree to so much that I don't have many remarks to make. Okay then, so thank you, thank you so much to the both of you for, for joining us and Ambassador Vandal and Andrew Imbri. I would also uh, like to thank our wonderful audience, of course, uh, for their questions and for their participation today. If you would like to know more about our projects, the EU Cross German Net Network and the EU funded GLOBE project, uh, which both explore uh, global challenges from a European perspective, please follow us on Twitter at EU Cross and at GLOBE EU and visit the website at globe-project.eu as we will be sharing updates on upcoming events. From Andrew Imbri, Ambassador Vendel, and myself, it's thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much.